Welcome to Friday night at Egan here. Uh, my name is Daniel Monteith and I'm the department chair of the social sciences and I'd like to welcome all of you here and thank you for coming out on a busy Friday night. I know there are a lot of things going on. First Friday, our colleagues, the Downhowers, are doing a, a reading downtown. So a lot of different things going on. But we're excited to have you out here this fall and it's always kind of a uh, interesting time to be able to share with the community so many of the different uh, works and research that faculty members and guests that we bring to the university are doing. So this is our chance to share with you and excited tonight uh, with our guest speaker Alex Simon. I will introduce him in a minute but I want to put in a plug for next week. Into the Abyss, submarine exploration of the largest undersea canyon in the world. So uh, that's by Michelle Ridgway, a uh, marine ecologist. So that's next week, uh, October 10th, and that promises to be an exciting lecture. We have uh, several more, and if you're kind of wondering about what's up, uh, look for one of these posters. I've seen them all around town. Also, um, you can listen to your favorite radio station uh, near you or in town. Um, they're making announcements regularly. Uh, I know Alex also does it, or the guest speaker does an interview on K2 on Thursday afternoon, so you can get a little bit of a, a teaser of what the Friday night at Egan lecture is going to be all about. Well, tonight we have Alex Simon, and he is a professor of sociology here at uh, UAS. He comes to us uh, by way of uh, Simon Fraser University, where he was, where he received his PhD in sociology. Uh, after that, he ended up, uh, most recently, he was at Utah Valley University in Utah, where he was a tenured associate professor. So we were lucky to kind of steal him away from the Sun Belt down there and bring him up to the rainforest. He, uh, I think, had this draw to the rainforest of the Northwest. Uh, Alex Simon specializes in environmental sociology and political economy. His past research includes political economy of British Columbia's forest industry and ethics of buffalo hunting in the American West. Uh, he's published several articles on these different topics and we're very fortunate to have him here join our social science faculty. Uh, he's very inspirational to many of our students. And so, without further ado, Alex Simon. Please turn off your cell phones and alarms on your watches. Thank you. Thank you. Is the microphone working now? Good. OK, so um, I just wanted, before I begin, give this short definition of what anthropocentrism is, is that anthropocentrism is the belief that humans uh, are the only species worthy of any sort of moral consideration, but also as far as um, ecosystems, this idea that you can actually fragment eco e ecosystems, so take predators out, uh, for instance, without any adverse consequences. Um, and that I, I think when we talk about predator control, that that's one major perspective uh, in that debate. And then ecocentrism, is the belief that all species have the biotic right to exist. Now, what, what that means is that individual, spe individual members of species can be killed. So of course, you know, as humans, we have to kill other species, species to survive. I mean, even vegetarians have to kill some form of life. But that uh, if someone's ecocentric, that doesn't preclude them from hunting or something like that. But recognizing that as a species, everything has a right to exist, including predator species. Now, as far as ecosystems go, it's the recognition that you really can't fragment um, complex ecosystems, that you can't take predators out, that they fulfill vital needs. Now, every uh, culture tells myths about itself. And I think one of the myths that we have in Alaska is that there's this debate which consists of uh, Alaskans who have like this in these interactions with the earth and that they have these long-standing traditions where they really uh, know how to take care of the environment and that they and, and that there are these like outside interests like French intellectuals so that's a picture of Michel Foucault um, 
as far as I know, we didn't really say much about predator control. Uh, but that, but that this idea that there are these outsiders, these tulip sniffers, who really don't know anything about the environment, and, and if these outsiders would just leave us alone, that us real Alaskans could, could exist because we, we know the way that nature works. Well, anthropocentrism has its roots in Europe, not, not Alaska. Um, it, and so what some people have referred to as old Europe, right? So remember <laughs> Donald Rumsfeld talking about that. That's kind of blurry. I think I've got a better photograph of Rumsfeld. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, um, so any, anyhow, if we, if we look at eco, e ecocentrism, uh, really has its roots within the United States. And so if we look at thinkers like Henry David Thoreau, or Aldo Leopold, for instance, or uh, more local, uh, that, that, that's a photograph of Victor Van Vallenberg. So he's a retired wildlife biologist from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's very critical of predator control programs in Alaska. No one can say that he doesn't have some idea. He interacts a lot with the natural environment and the way these ecosystems work. He currently does uh, research in Denali. Now, um, if we look at uh, the history of human-wolf interactions, is that wolves have been around for about two million years, uh, so far longer than humans, and that uh, wolves, I believe, have been in Alaska for about 500,000 years, and uh, that throughout most of human history, people and wolves have coexisted, they've, li they've lived in close proximity to one another. And so if we look at Native Americans, um, that they interacted with wolves in very different ways than Euro-Americans interacted with wolves. And so that, uh, they, that sometimes Native Americans killed wolves, but that was usually for, you know, to, to gather ornaments or things for religious purposes, is that their economy uh, was very different. So I realize I'm talking about a very culturally diverse group, but one thing that their economy had that I, didn't have that ours does is capitalism has a growth imperative. So this idea that it has to constantly expand. And I think that that's one of the reasons why many Native Americans were able to interact with the environment in sustainable ways, but also they had beliefs that were ecocentric. For them, it would have been immoral to try to wipe out wolves or other predator species. And so that really, so that really affected the way that they interacted uh, with wolves. And so when Europeans came to the United States, uh, or I guess we could say North America, uh, that human-wolf interactions changed dramatically. And so what, one of the things that the political economist James O'Connor has said about capitalism is that capitalism tends to remake nature in its own image. By this, what he, what he means is that you have complex ecosystems, like say an old, old growth forest ecosystem, and that uh, what industrial forests would say is that, that this is really kind of worthless, it's decadent old growth, and that uh, so, so to alter nature. Uh, so that it can be used, and so to take out things, and so they, like they describe certain trees as being weed species, and so to remove those from the ecosystems, and so that you just leave behind, uh, so, so what Leopold talked about is separating the economic parts of the biotic clock from the non-economic parts, so that you see old growth forest systems become pine plantations. You see wild fisheries become fish farms. Now, if we look at wolves as far as capitalism is involved, is that wolves are top-level predators, that they consume a lot of meat. So I don't know, somewhere between five and 10 pounds a day, depending on what, what research you read. And so they certainly, so, so they're kind of at the top of the biotic pyramid, and that, you know, we're below them, actually. I mean, we're, we're omnivores. So we're below them in the biotic pyramid, is they consume a lot of energy. And that if you look at it from an economic point of view, the most rational thing to do is to eliminate things that compete with humans. And so uh, it wasn't until the early 1600s in Jamestown, Virginia, that uh, people started to ra raise livestock, uh, on a large scale at least. And so what, what occurred was uh, that y they uh, began to hack down the forests and then, and, and then of course, replace wild game with you know, cows and pigs and, and whatnot. And that wolves were like, oh, good, these move a lot slower, you know, th th than deer. And so uh, that, that, of course, affected uh, the interactions. And so 
that we see, you know, from the 1600s on, essentially, um, essentially becoming uh, Euro Americans becoming obsessed with eradicating wolves. And so, on the East Coast, uh, this started full scale, um, and then as, as Euro Americans moved westward, this continued. And so we see other ecosystems. So like on the Great Plains, you had um, bison, uh, you know, b the bison herds. And of course, wolves would follow those. Native Americans would follow those. And coyotes would follow those as well. And that they all coexisted quite well with, uh, with uh, one another. Um, but that uh, the logic of capitalism leads to different things. And so of course, dead wolves, dead buffalo, and that's, and that's a picture of Wounded Knee, so one of the last massacres of Native Americans. And so that, you know, why, why was it important to get Native Americans out of the way? Well, they didn't really have any desire to be wage slaves, right? So they, did, they, they didn't want to, uh, they cer certainly didn't want to be formal slaves, but they also didn't want to give up hunting and gathering traditions or horticultural traditions and, you know, to be a farmer, you know, to, to work on other people's land that, that, uh, they, di that they didn't own. And that if we look at this eradication of species, continued pretty well unmitigated throughout most of the 19th century. Uh, and then when we see uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century, that proponents of capitalism, like say, for instance, Theodore Roosevelt or Ginfer, Gifford Pinchot, the first director of the US Forest Service, they began to get scared. And they said, well, wait a minute, unfettered capitalism uh, tends to be biocidal. Right? As they say, that we actually have to rein in. And so that many of you know that, of course, Roosevelt uh, was instrumental. Oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. So, so you see the simplification of ecosystems. So you see these uh, basically, yeah, you know, feedlots. But anyhow, uh, to, to Roosevelt is that, uh, that, that, uh, that he created uh, many national parks, national forests, national monuments, and that uh, so, so we looked at it through a different lens, but in regard to predator species, one, one of the things that Roosevelt did was uh, that he would go out and hunt wolves with his companions, and they would kill wolves indiscriminately, but then also kill the pups. And what he had to say about wolves is, well, they're vermin, you don't, that, that essentially fair chase ethics don't apply. And, then, and that's really the contemporary argument used here, too, like why is it okay to kill, kill wolves from airplanes? Why is it okay to take pups from their den? is that fair chase ethics don't apply. So this isn't some relic you know, from the early 20th century, that, that those, those thoughts are still with us. And I, and I think it's important to realize that a lot of things we think today, uh, that even though it, maybe we're not aware of these thinkers, that, that, that they certainly influenced our roots. Um, and I think that you have to judge people within the historical context that, that in which they occurred. Is I, I think that uh, we have a lot to thank Teddy Roosevelt for, that even uh, even even uh, within that time, that Aldo Leopold, so one of one of the real uh, influential thinkers as far as ecocentric thought, he was an advocate. So in the early 20th century, uh, he was a real advocate for eradicating wolves and cougars, and he thought, great, we got to get these out of the way, so there are more elk, there are more deer to hunt, um, and that these people were informed. People like Pinchot or Leopold were informed by Western science, and that Western science is also anthropocentric. And it, it has basic assumptions. And so uh, this is a picture of, well, I guess, I guess we'd say a painting of Rene Descartes. And that some of you have heard of this concept of Cartesian dualism. And so where, where, um, what Descartes did is he separated the universe into thinking subjects, being humans, and passive objects. So many of you have heard this statement, I think, therefore I am. You know, so doubting everything, the systematic, positive sort of analysis. Well, what Descartes believed is that non-human animals were basically machine-like, and so that they didn't have any souls, they didn't have any real feelings, uh, that the way that they behaved was clever, um, but that they didn't experience pain, and so that he would do live dissections of animals and say, well, see how they responded, to say that they're, they're of interest, but the same thing is at least to thinking of ecosystems, is that you can just take out things that don't appear to be economic and replace them uh, so, so that, and, and replace them with other things uh, that are economic. Uh, and so this has had a profound effect on Western thought. And so even people who haven't heard of Descartes uh, 
still operate, this is part of our dominant ideology, is that humans are really the only thing out there that genuinely matter, and that many people would operate from the premise that pretty much any human interest is going to trump any non-human interest. But then also important to realize the assumptions about how ecosystems function, that you can basically fragment them, take them apart, and just manipulate them. And so we see the process of eradicating wolves continue into the 20th century. Uh, so in 1915, Congress directed the Bureau of the Biological Survey to kill the few remaining wolves. Uh, and the, I know right now we, we think, well, the government shouldn't be stepping in to help out the private sector, you know, with, with the investment banks. But there's, no, there's nothing new about the government stepping in helping businesses. Uh, that by the 20th century, wolves have been, become pretty good at avoiding humans and avoiding traps. And so the government hired professional hunters and professional trappers to eradicate the few remaining wolves in the American West. Um, and so by 1930, wolves were virtually extinct uh, in the lower 48. In Alaska, a bounty was, re was introduced in 1915 as well, uh, where predator control really began to take off uh, was in the, in the 1940s. Um, and so back then, uh, poisoning was very common. Aerial hunting uh, was also common. Uh, now what I find interesting, if you go back into the 1940s, the population of Alaska was under 75,000. But even under those conditions, and so we're up around, you know, uh, si high 600,000s, low 700,000s at this point. But even going back, so under 100,000 people, there's the perception there's not enough game animals out there to fulfill people's uh, to, to fulfill fill people's needs or wants. Um, and so by the 1950s, the wolf population had been dramatically reduced. And one of the things that, that happened back in the 50s is that, of course, you, you, take away, you take away these predators, you see this population explosion among ungulates, um, and then population crashes occurring. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. But currently, we have somewhere around 7,500 to 11,000 wolves in Alaska about 1,500 to 1,700 are killed annually. The most common methods are actually trapping and hunting, so people are allowed to hunt them from snow machines. I know that aerial hunting is more controversial, but I think last year somewhere maybe around 125 wolves were taken, so mo mostly it's trapping and hunting where they are taken. Uh, and so th those are the economics of why wolves are killed, and so pretty much for the same reasons now as they were in 1600. Uh, but also Western stupers, me, superstitions uh, regarding wolves. And so when Europeans came over, it wasn't like they had a lot of direct contact with wolves. So wolves have been extinct in England since 1500. And so uh, they didn't really know much about wolves, but they had all kinds of superstitions. One was that ma many of our, uh, well, if you're Euro-American, many of our ancestors believed in werewolves. Uh, and that there were a lot of, uh, th that there were, a lot of stories about wolves um, that, you know, engaging in these vicious attacks. One, one story was about this couple that was out in their sleigh and they're surrounded by a pack of wolves and they were going to be killed and they had a big family and they actually had to feed a couple of their kids to the wolf pack to placate them so the wolves let them go. So that, that it wasn't at all uncommon for wolves not only to be killed but to be tortured to death uh, in, in pretty, you know, pretty uh, nasty ways for wolves to be tortured to death, so that wolves basically became a metaphor for everything that the colonists fear, many of the things. And so uh, Cotton Mather, so he was, uh, that, that he was, uh, you know, Boston clergyman, but that he said that wolves, uh, that wolves and actually Native Americans, that they were in league with the devil uh, and pretty much other creatures of the forest. And so this idea of wolves, uh, of wolves harassing that kind of looks like a scene from Mendenhall Lake in the winter, right? The wolf coming out and getting the people. Uh, but that, that the wolves were, were vicious and that, uh, and, and, and that pretty much any group that was feared back then, so certainly Native Americans were said to be like wolves and that they were, for one thing, they were cowardly, but then they also used um, these brutal tactics to attack Native, Native colonists. And the, the group that Cotton Mather feared were, were um, Quakers. And so he said that the Quakers were like wolves that attacked his congregation. And so not, we don't fear Quakers that much anymore. Maybe, maybe <laughs> like Richard Nixon, but uh, not, not so much Quakers in general. But wolves continue to affect, 
contemporary political discourse. And so in 2004, if you go on YouTube, if you Google, uh, or if you put in uh, Carrie Bush and wolves, you, you can pull up this ad and it said, well, the, the terrorists were like wolves and it shows this wolf pack coming out of the woods uh, and that Carrie was not equipped to protect us from the wolves uh, like, like Bush could. And so that it's kind of like being soft on terrorism. It, in Alaska, it can actually, and I'll get into this in a bit, it can be kind of like being soft on wolves. You really, because you, you don't want to be indecisive, you want to be a strong, strong leader. A more recent political ad by McCain, and, and I think there's a certain irony in this, uh, compared uh, Barack Obama and, and also critics of Sarah Palin to being like a pack of wolves, and again, showing the pack of wolves coming out, and that, uh, and that Sarah Palin being victimized by by wolves. Uh, if we look at more recent uh, elections in Alaska, that our, our last governor election, one of the things that Tony Knowles received criticism for is that he ran a sissified game board. And so that, that part of the way we construct masculinity is that we're supposed to be indifferent to the suffering of non-humans, right? And that uh, certainly, certainly that, that, you know, to be a hunter is part of the masculine uh, identity. And I, I don't have anything against hunter, hunters. I, I've hunted all my life. I continue to hunt. But one thing, you know, I, I'll have to acknowledge is that, uh, you know, and I've killed big game, you know, certainly very, very large game. It's not difficult to do. I could probably take any 10-year-old, get them good enough with a rifle so that they could kill, you know, a buffalo or an elk quickly, right? Uh, but somehow that's been equated with masculinity in our society. But so that Tony Knowles didn't support killing wolves and it actually ran a, a sissified game board full of sissies. And that, uh, th that uh, Sarah Palin, she became governor with the endorsement of the Alaska Outdoor Council. So they, you know, they said, well, she's going to support these sort of things, endorsed also by the National Rifle Association. So, so part of this, you know, being a strong leader is this indifference to the suffering of non-human animals. Uh, now, uh, as we go on into the 20th century, I'd mentioned earlier that Aldo Leopold had been an advocate of killing wolves, and that that was uh, something he thought was good. He thought that more wolves meant more deer. And so th this is a photograph of Leopold. And so uh, Leopold was uh, educated, uh, I believe, at Princeton. He was a, 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 had a, a master's in forestry. Um, one of the things that he began to question uh, later in his career is he said, you know, I doubt you can actually separate what he called the economic parts from the non-economic parts of the biological clocks. And so he thought that essentially that predators f fulfilled vital functions. And one of the things he said is that humans cannot step in and fulfill the role of natural predators. That, that the, predator, the, the natural predators and humans hunt in very different ways. So, you know, for one thing, I mean, particularly if we look at trophy hunting, is that trophy hunters want the, uh, the, the essentially the most, most, most vital, the biggest um, males from the group. These are the ones that have the best genetic stock. Well, predators, I mean, you think about it, it's rational of your predators. So one, one thing that like wolves will do is latch onto the snout of a moose and then have other mooses get in there. Or that, that you, oh, wait a minute, other mooses aren't involved. Other wolves get in there, right. <laughs> other wolves get in there. Well, there could be some collaboration. I don't know, uh, but so 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 anyhow, the, the, uh, it's pretty hard for wolves to kill a moose, and so of course you're going to pick on the weakest moose, the sick moose, uh, and that, or, or the same thing with caribou. And these are members of, of herds that they can do without, you know, as far as spreading diseases, this sort of thing. Uh, and so that Leopold maintained that they actually uh, that, that hunters can take their place. Uh, now I'm, I'm originally from from upstate New York, and that, of course, most of the natural predators have uh, been killed off there a long, long time ago. Uh, and I, I grew up hunting white-tailed deer. And at this point, one of the things nationally is fewer and fewer people are hunting. And that when I go home, that, you know, having my mother say, could you please go out and shoot some deer? And so she has a nuisance permit, so it's legal, you know, too. Is that, that they basically take the place over because uh, humans really don't fulfill that need. Uh, and, and so. Uh, destroying crops, automobile accidents, this sort of thing, is probably what they need is some wolves in New York State. And, and there's been actually some talk about reintroducing them into the Adirondacks. Um, so Leopold believed, you know, based on scientific data, that predators needed to, to uh, fulfill these roles. But it wasn't 
really scientific data that convinced him it was actually shooting a mother wolf and her pups with some friends. And so this is a very famous qu quote out of the Sand County Almanac, so that, that him, him realizing that, uh, that the wolves actually belonged in those ecosystems and that it really isn't the right of people to remove them from, from, the, from the ecosystems. And so uh, Leopold died uh, shortly actually before the Sand County Almanac was published. But there's been a lot of, but then there's, there, there's been a lot of research published since that, and he wrote other essays, you know, on predator control, or on, on the role of predators, and uh, that in 1995, wolves were reintroduced into the Yellow, Yellowstone ecosystem, and so that there's a whole lot of research in there indicating that in the absence of wolves or predators like bear, if you, if you remove them, that undulates tend to overbrowse the system, and that you have crashes of both predators and undulates when, when, you, when you remove, when you remove uh, predators from, from the system. Uh, and so there's a bunch of research. Now, if we look at Alaska research, um, that, uh, so Victor uh, Van Ballenberg, and uh, he's a former Board of Game member as well as being a wildlife biologist, quoting directly from him, he's saying, Alaska's record of managing high-density undulate populations demonstrates a consistent inability to prevent undulates from exceeding carrying capacity or quickly responding once problems are apparent. Efforts to chase unattainable uh, population and harvest objectives with poorly designed predator control programs risk long-term sustainability of undulates. Protection of habitat integrity and pre uh, or, and predator population viability. And so basically, you know, vindicating what Leopold had said. In 2007, Governor Palin received a letter from, it was, it was signed um, by, I think, 150 scientists. I can't remember the exact number. But the letter uh, said that the predator control programs as they currently exist in Alaska have many adverse um, biological consequences, including, quote, habitat damage from high undulate populations that may result in population crashes of both undulates and predators. Uh, that other, other research done, done in Alaska, the wildlife biologist Gordon Haber, uh, he's taken the argument, so, so certainly challenging Cartesian dualism, he's saying, well, wait a minute, wolves are actually highly sentient social animals. And, that there are predator species, they've been around, you know, for millions of years, they're not, they, they haven't evolved to actually be preyed upon like, like we, we've done. Um, and that killing individual members of the packs actually disrupt the pack's social structure. And, and so that they have these hierarchies and you start killing members, it, it disrupts the, the social structure of the pack, but also their ability to socialize uh, younger members of the pack. And so with human communities, you know, you can go in and you can do physical genocide and that maybe people will survive, but it certainly disrupts the culture within that. Uh, so another justification for predator control programs has been feeding the rural poor. And uh, an Alaskan woman, Karen Dietheridge, just looked at the data uh, through Fish and Game, and she found that in three out of the five wolf control areas, that the majority of the moose were killed either by urban hunters or by people who reside outside of Alaska. Uh, and so, that, uh, well, one, one thing I would say is that, that Dietheridge suggested that there should be a rural preference for hunters. Uh, so, that if you live in close proximity to a caribou herd, and particularly if you're a rural subsistence hunter, that you should have preference over somebody from out of state or somebody from Anchorage or Juneau. Um, but that that's a position which is opposed by the Alaskan Outdoor Council. It's also opposed by Safari Club International. So any sort of hunting rights based on heritage, you know, cultural heritage or geographic uh, location or I would imagine social class as well. Now we have seen public attitudes certainly change about wolves. And so that the older images aren't that popular anymore. So this would be one, one of the more, uh, a newer image of a wolf. Um, and that I, I think that most people, uh, the, the general public, at the, in the 21st century would say, uh, yeah, it's still anthropocentric, that still human interest should be considered over non-human interest, but it has to be some vital human interest at stake. And so 
that most people say, well, yeah, you, know, you go out and kill a moose or a deer if you're trying to feed your family. And that maybe, you know, even, um, I'm thinking like an ecocentric uh, philosopher like Arne Ness, for instance, a Norwegian philosopher said, is it justifiable to kill like the last tiger to save your family? And you say, well, yes, because you're a human, th those are where your initial, and particularly to your family, those are where your alliances should be. Um, but that most people uh, are not willing to see wolves killed for what they would consider to be trivial or non-vital interests. So um, that one of the things that's not well regarded in, in our society in general uh, would be trophy hunting. And so that, you know, killing uh, is really a form of conspicuous consumption of wildlife. And so uh, the idea would be to take, you know, the head or the antlers and put it in your office or, uh, you know, in, in your den or living room and say, okay, well, I've conquered, the, I, I've conquered this particular animal. And that, of course, many people, if you're flying from Connecticut or something to hunt in Alaska, many people, that's the only thing they take home. Um, it was actually interesting. When I, when I was in Utah, um, I was lucky enough to draw on a wild bison. And it you know, took me like four days to carry the thing out. And one of my neighbors, come, I, and I left the head back, you know, is that, that I wasn't going to eat the head. I don't have any interest in head cheese or something like that. Uh, and that, uh, that one, one of my neighbors said, well, that's the only thing I would have brought out. Uh, and to me, it's if you're going to carry something, maybe carry something you're actually going to eat. But uh, that, uh, th so uh, the people wouldn't consider this to be uh, a, a vital interest. Uh, but again, uh, that other non-vital interests aren't, aren't considered as well. I mean, there's a lot as far as like groups that really promote uh, the trophy hunting. If we look at um, Safari Club International has many corporate sponsors, including Cabela's or Brass Bass Pro Shops or weapons manufacturers, uh, or other groups. I, I think that's another false, uh, that's another myth, is it's kind of like local Alaskans versus outsiders. If we look at the Ballot Issues Coalition, um, that was involved in defeating an issue that would have banned bear baiting. So that's putting out stale bait goods and stuff to draw bears in, habituate them, and kill them. So a couple of years ago, that was defeated. Well, that operates out of Virginia, and that it's mostly weapons manufacturers that fund the Ballot Issues Coalition. And they, and they actually gave a lot to the Political Action Committee, um, Alaskans for Professional Wildlife Management, uh, to defeat Ballot Measure 2, which would have banned aerial hunting of wolves. I think the other thing that really isn't mentioned in the, in the public discourse enough is that our Division of Wildlife Conservation has an interest in having out-of-state hunters come in to, to hunt. Um, is that a lot of money, so I think their budget's roughly $20 million. Last year, they collected almost $5.5 million um, from out-of-state hunting licenses and big game tags. But th these, things aren't really, th these things aren't really mentioned. And so in order to get people to think, OK, well, that we need to wipe out packs of wolves, that you have to focus on uh, what would be uh, considered vital human interest. And so what, what sort of things are going to justify this? Uh, so we look at, you, you, that many of you are probably aware that the, that the state legislature approved $400,000 to educate the public on predator control programs. And one of the things that they've done is they, that they, they limit the scope of the debate. And that's really done by ignoring scientific data. And so, well, I wouldn't say they ignore scientific data. They will mention some data and ignore others. And so the data they tend to mention is that, yes, it is possible uh, to artificially inflate the number of moose and caribou by killing wolves or killing bears. And, and I believe that, that that's fairly well established. I think that the National Research Council basically said, yeah, it, that is possible to do that. Or is it possible uh, to wipe out a good number of wolves and have their populations recover? Yeah, that's possible. Of course, it can disrupt the pack. Uh, you know, but the data they ignore is, well, what does that do actually to the wolf pack? But also, what, what does it do to the long-term uh, viability of both wolves, but then also ungulates? Uh, and so th that data is just simply ignored in the literature put out by the state. Um, that, uh, the other thing that you see is it really only cites um, it only cites what many would consider to be vital reasons for predator control and never talks about 
trophy hunting or, uh, or, or basically funding a state bureaucracy. And so if we look at the propaganda favoring, uh, favoring predator control, is that they'll say, well, it's necessary uh, in order to feed impoverished rural people and that also for, uh, and also to support traditional cultures. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about feeding, um, f feeding, uh, you know, the 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 uh, rural poor. Is that they never really specify well how many people are actually out there dependent on wild game to survive. Uh, so myself, I, I'm an urban-based hunter, and that most urban-based hunters are willing to admit that it's not a real economically rational way to feed yourself. Um, that, that if you look at the time, if you look at the money. Uh, involved in going out and getting game, uh, that certainly it would be cheaper for me to go to Costco to buy something than, than, than it would be to go out um, and, and do, do the hunting. Um, but, you know, certainly there are people who live in remote communities where they don't have a Costco um, and that they do have wild game close to them so that they don't have to spend all kinds of fossil fuels going out and, and after them. Um, but they never really say, well, how many people are there? And that was one of the things, you know, that I asked this game of board member when, it, when they were presenting in Juno, and he said, well, I don't have any specific data. Uh, he did say, well, malnutrition isn't really a, a lar large spread problem in Alaska. Um, but they do list five communities that they claim are both rural and uh, that, that they have a low median household income, but they don't say how many people are in these communities. They don't say how many people are depending on game. And so I looked at the census data those five combined communities have a population of somewhere around 2,000. And then the other thing, I, I looked at the data, if we banned out-of-state hunting, that you, so if we look at the equivalent to the moose and caribou that are taken from out-of-state hunters, you could give everybody in these villages uh, half a moose, so each person half a moose and a whole caribou. Uh, so there's a whole lot of meat flowing out uh, from, you know, that you're not coming up here from Connecticut to hunt because you're starving, you're coming up for, you're coming up for a trophy. Uh, now onto the cultural issues, I think that this is purposely vaguely defined, is that um, if we look at um, the state, well, that Sarah Palin came, was elected with the support of essentially hunting interest groups. As I mentioned before, the Alaska Outdoor Council is opposed to any preferential treatment for natives. They're opposed to um, preferential treatment for people in rural areas. And so I think if you claim that it was necessary to support native cultures, then that would tend to undermine, um, the, the, you know, that would tend to undermine the claims of these interest groups that supported the current government. Um, but what has been done, so in like Northern Ontario, the claims were made that uh, hunting was important because it, it, it was necessary for the preservation of uh, essentially white guys going out and hunting. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I mean, what, 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 what's an authentic culture and what's not an authentic culture uh, is, is certainly up for debate. Now, in Alaska, I think if you made that claim, um, that, that that would be subjected to criticism. So if we look at Alaska, um, that, you know, contrary to shows like Northern Exposure or whatnot, the majority of Alaskans live in rural areas. Or, down, sorry. Uh, the, more, the majority of Alaskans live in urban areas, so the overwhelming majority. And so then less than 25% of the population live in what could be considered rural areas. And so the majority of Alaskans live in urban areas. The majority of Alaskans don't hunt. And so nationwide, the number of people who hunt has been dropping, and that's been true in Alaska as well. So, I mean, if you look back over the last 10 years, every year they're selling fewer and fewer uh, hunting licenses, fewer and fewer game tags. Um, and so th that it's mostly, Alaska is mostly an urban-based population. Most people aren't hunting. But then if we look at the population of Alaska, so I mentioned in the 40s, go back in populations under 100,000. It wasn't until you know, the 1960s, 1970s, the construction of the pipeline and the subsequent oil boom that you start to see it burgeoning. And so the population growth. Uh, and so that most people uh, who, uh, who live in Alaska and hunt, they have very shallow roots in Alaska. So I mean, if we look at public figures, uh, um, like what, for instance, Sarah Palin wasn't, uh, um, wasn't born here. Um, or, um, 
what is it, uh, the Alaskan governor uh, back, in the, back in the 50s, he was shooting a lot of wolves, can't, can't think of it, Hammond, uh, Jay Hammond. Uh, he was born in Troy, New York. I mean, so that most people uh, who actually uh, live here and are hunting, it would be shallow roots, so you can't claim that either. So I think there's reasons for vaguely defining culture. Now, I think if we were to actually have an honest debate, and, and this certainly is not an honest debate, um, I think it's really excellent po propaganda, but it's bad science and it's really poor political sociology. An honest debate about predator control would say, okay, on the one side, we have concerns about healthy ecosystems, we have concerns about wolves as individuals or as packs. We have concerns about the long-term health of undulates, so moose and caribou, and also ecotourism. The far more Alaskans, and, and pe the, certainly people coming from out of state, are involved in wildlife viewing. And so actually wildlife viewing uh, generates more dollars for the state than certainly hunting does. On the other side, you could say, well, certainly there's trophy hunting. There's funding a government bureaucracy. There are rural people who do depend on game. Uh, and then we could say that authentically that there are some native cultures that have long-standing traditions that we need to consider. Uh, and so whether or not trophy or wh whether or not predator control is a good idea or a bad idea, uh, you know, I, I guess that's yet to be resolved. But I think what we need is to honestly look at all of the issues involved. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so at this point, I guess we could open it up to questions. And so I, I guess the, the best thing, because this is being streamed live, is that uh, if you could wait for the, if you have a question, to wait till the microphone is, is available. So this is the magic microphone, and uh, you need to speak into it so that uh, as this goes out in TV world, they can hear your question. Uh, so raise your hand, and uh, we have somebody who will help get the microphone to you. Uh, you were speaking of Sarah Palin's uh, view of, of uh, the predator control, and I, I heard a, one of her campaign speeches down south where she was uh, stating that we that support, that don't support wolf control were, uh, she said that we didn't understand pest control such as coyotes and wolves. And so I tried to do a little bit of research on wolf-coyote uh, uh, relationships. Right. And one of the things that I read was that until uh, wolves were uh, eradicated from down south in the lower 48, coyotes were pretty much uh, contained within the Midwest, and now they are truly pests because they have no predators. So the question I have is, um, do you think they will ever, uh, the, in the lower 48, they will ever reinstate the wolves? And do you think it will do anything for the, you know, to control the coyote? And do you think coyotes could move into Alaska uh, if uh, Sarah Palin destroys the wolves the way she is so far? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Oh, yeah, and that, that's true that, that, that I didn't mention that really the only species that, so you had, you know, the situation where the coyotes and the wolves and Native Americans were following, uh, were, were, were following uh, buffalo herds. And so what they used to do is, uh, after the buffalo were killed, uh, that the hunters would lace the, uh, would lace the carcasses with cyanide. So the wolves and the coyotes would die. And then, as you say, what happened is for the first time in history, coyotes went to the east of the Mississippi. Which is a real problem. So, like, like my sister-in-law is, you know, still still upset as a coyote went in and killed her cat. As coyotes are really good at reproducing, and and uh, that, there, so there are many people in places like Connecticut or, or New York who are, who are upset by this, and that that's been one of the things suggested in the Adirondack Mountains. If you want to suppress the coyotes, because humans can't do it, because coyotes are just too smart, really. I mean, that uh, well, one of the things that that uh, in Utah. They, they would talk about eradicating wolves, and they used to call coyotes desert wolves, and then they realized that they couldn't kill them, get rid of them all. And so then they started to call them coyotes, so they claimed they'd gotten rid of all the wolves. Uh, but 
So, uh, so, so, so anyhow, yeah, I, I would think that certainly in places, particularly like the Five Ponds region of the Adirondacks, would make sense to reintroduce wolves. And the other thing, not just coyotes, but I'd mentioned the whitetail populations in places like Connecticut or, or New York, they're, they're just out of control. And, and so that I think that wolves could be beneficial. And of course, the same kind of scare tactics, you know, that say, well, the wolves will come and eat your babies and that sort of thing. Uh, that, um, that, that certainly coyotes are much more prone to come up and eat your cat or your poodle or something like that. They're much a much bolder species in that in that way. You know, I I, I agree that, like in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the goal was to eradicate wolves. Yeah. But I don't think you, it's fair to say that that's the goal of predator management by in Alaska because the law requires that. Right no less than 20% remain so that they can rebuild. They're trying to put some balance into the right. equation. Right, and, and, that, and that's certainly a fair statement, is that their stated goal is not to wipe out all wolves. To my knowledge, there are some regions in the state where, they, where the goal is 100% removal of wolves, but on the whole. That's not true. Um, well, I, I'm just going against by. Against the law. What, I'm sorry? That would be against the law. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just going by what people from the, the uh, um, Alaska Fisheries and Game have told me. So, I mean, I don't know. Uh, no, per, no. It's per, 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 perhaps, perhaps I'm incorrect about that. But you are, but, but certainly you're correct, is that the stated goal is not total wolf eradication, but uh, certainly uh, artificially suppressing their populations. I mean, if we look back, to, you know, with technology, that 100% of the state's pretty much open to hunting at this point, you know, with planes and uh, snowmobiles and this sort of thing, is that our ability to kill wolves is so much greater than it's ever been in human history. And so um, to suppress them to the point, uh, you know, where, where, where I guess there's enough undulates to satisfy, and I, I think this is kind of a, um, an unattainable goal to, to satisfy uh, the desires of out-of-state hunters, in state, in, in state urban hunters and then also rural hunters, uh, at least what Victor Van Vallenberg has said is we're chasing these goals uh, of population levels that were back in the 50s with, with this wolf suppression. He's saying it's just not possible. The other thing the National Research Council has said is that you really can't have uh, predictable levels of prey out there is that there's so many variables involved with prey. So, I mean, if you just look locally at our, at our, our deer population, so wolves certainly aren't a factor in Admiralty Island, right? Uh, but just weather conditions. And so populations are going to expand, they're going to contract, you know, regardless of there's predators out there or not. But yeah, I, I would, would agree with you that certainly uh, the stated goal, at least, is not total wolf eradication. One last point I would make that you mentioned over and over that it's the benefit of the non-resident hunter, but as as moose or caribou populations get to re very low levels, the law first, the Board of Game is required to eliminate right. non-resident hunting yeah. completely. And then uh, we can go to a tier two for only the subsistence hunters can do right. it. But by law, we can't do that just for the local people. Right. So uh, I think to say that it's done so that we could, the Fish and Game Department can make money is very inaccurate. Well, it's certainly accurate that they make a lot of money from out-of-state out licenses, Most right? Most of that is from brown bears and sheep. Well, not, not, and, moose, and a, not moose tags and caribou tags? There's, a lot of, there, there, there's, there's, some, certainly, there, there's certainly a lot of moose and a lot of caribou taken by out-of-state hunters. The point I wanted to make is yeah. in the air, it's a huge state. Right. In these areas, the five areas where wolf, control, or wolf predator management yeah. is practiced, non-residents are not allowed to hunt. Haven't been way before they started doing predator management and probably will never be allowed to hunt there again. Okay, well, uh, the, 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 the research I quoted from Catherine Dietrich, she was saying actually in three out of those five areas were predominantly urban-based or out-of-state hunters. She's dead wrong. Okay, maybe she is, but that's, that's based on I, her I, was, I was a director of the Wildlife Division for eight years and deputy commissioner for four, uh -huh. so I think that I know the figures. Well, maybe. Uh, show them to me. Okay, well. <laughs> You know where to find me. Uh, first two comments, thank you very much for the presentation. I appreciated it greatly. Um, second, I find it interesting that the state keeps saying how necessary this is, 
um, when they can only do it on, as was pointed out, a small percentage of uh, the land in Alaska because the federal government won't allow it. Right. Um, and it, I don't see that the rest of the state is in terrible, dire situation because of the lack of predator control. So to me, that's just a facade. I don't see any defense for it. Um, if, as you pointed out, the public view is changing, why, how can we account for the fact that the last measure failed? And what can someone like me do? I see what someone like you can do. But what can an average person do to have an honest debate instead of the propaganda that we're getting? Well, I, I think looking at well, why, why, did, uh, why, why did ballot measure two fail, uh, I was a bit surprised because if you look at uh, twice before, Alaskans had voted on predator control and voted to ban aerial hunting. So why did it fail? I think there were a bunch of variables involved in that. Uh, for one thing, if you look at the way that ballot measure was written, uh, well, that uh, it's like my people, understanding yeah. wasn't originally written that no, way. No, no, and, and state and, right. did that. And, and so, what, what one of the things that Nick Jans had commented was, he feels it was purposely misleading. Well, it's uh, obvious, right? And, and so, I, I think that that somebody could look at that and think, well, this is going to expand predator control. And so, I think that was one factor. But then, at least to my knowledge, this is the first time where, at least if not direct uh, collusion, indirect collusion between the state government and hunting interest groups, and so that. Uh, if you look at like who's promoting predator control, um, that is primarily, I mean, if you look at where the money flows from, would be out of state interest. So I'd mentioned like the Ballot Issues Coalition certainly gave a lot of money to the Political Action Committee, Alaskans for Professional Wildlife Management. Uh, where does their money come from? Primarily from weapons manufacturers. You know, so they're located down in Virginia. Uh, if, if we look at Safari Club International, they have a bunch of corporate sponsors. And so that, you know, that, that uh, people want to be able to travel the globe and trophy hunt wherever they, they want to go to. And so that's certain, those are certainly powerful interests. Uh, now, to be fair, on the other side, uh, that you had Alaskans, what is it, Alaskans uh, for Wildlife. And so I, I think what's interesting politically is, you, is that if you're just looking at the political action committees involved, it looks like Alaskans for Professional Wildlife Management versus Alaskans for Wildlife. Well, that the main backer of the political action committee for uh, Alaskans for Wildlife was defenders of wildlife, right? So money coming from out of state with, with, with that as well. Um, your question, what can the average, what, what can the average person do? Um, I would uh, say that cer certainly um, disabuse, do, any citizen can write a letter to the editor, can disabuse the public of, uh, of, of, some, of some of these misconceptions uh, regarding predator control. Uh, this isn't a, a scientific study, but I, I know where I work, I work with a bunch of naturalists. And everybody decided they were going to vote against aerial hunting. Yeah. And it turned out after the fact, they at nine of the 12 voted for it because the way the wording was, you had to vote yes to mean no. Yeah. And, and it just seemed very deceptive. Yeah, no, that, that's actually something I want to study, give the ballot to people out of state who aren't familiar, and I, th I think a lot of people will find it confusing. Yeah. Right. Hello, thanks for your talk tonight. Um, I, too, am one of the people that was helping Nick Jans carry around petitions to get it on the ballot. Um, a couple of years ago, in, uh, um, among some of the creative writing courses I took here at UAS, one of them was in nature writing, and I took the subject of coyotes for the animal I was going to study and write about. I had like grown up in uh, the Midwest on a farm, and I saw everybody around me trying to kill all the coyotes they could. And as a child, I resented it, so I wanted to look into it. Um, in, any, in any case, um, I discovered something really astonishing to me about Aldo Leopold in the process. He had gone to um, uh, a national conference somewhere, a, a city in the east, uh, where he was bragging about his success at uh, exterminating all the coyotes, almost all the coyotes, right. down to the last three, and he was going to take care of those next year uh, in the state that he was uh, supposed to be working in, e either New Mexico or Arizona, I forget which. But then the thing that I believe, and this book author believed, turned him around, was not the thing we read about in um, Sand County Almanac, the old female wolf with a green fire mm. dying in her eyes. Rather, it was a hunting trip that he went on with pack animals into um, northern Mexico. 
where the um, ecosystem in northern Mexico was almost untouched. Um, it had, there had not been any attempt to control anything there, not too much hunting or anything. And he discovered that there were tremendous numbers of both ungulates and predators, and that they coexisted together wonderfully, and their population density was higher than anywhere he'd ever seen. That, I think, is what turned him around. And I think that's probably true. A real quick comment about Aldo Leopold. I think you bring up an excellent point. One of the things I really respect about him is he's somebody who's willing to change his mind because new data came in. And I think that that's becoming less and less common in our society is that regardless of the facts, some people are going to stick to a given position. And so I think we all have to be open uh, to, to new forms of data. But also what, what you're talking about is direct experience and that uh, I lived for a while in Wyoming and uh, that I certainly hunted there. I did a lot of backpacking. And I noticed the same thing in Yellowstone. It's like uh, the best hunting was out, just outside the boundaries of Yellowstone. Uh, that you know, there's, there's a lot of deer, there's a lot of elk there. And then if you actually go into Yellowstone, you know, of course there's the grizzly, there's the wolves, and there's just tons of game there or on the borders like Gallatin National Forest. Or the same thing, I mean, if you go into Denali or Kalawani National Park, there's plenty of moose, there's, there's you know, and, there, and there's wolves, there's bear. Um, is I think that practical experience, um, I guess that, that, that one of the best things people can do is actually interact with, with nature. And, and again, you know, and I do think that hunting is certainly one, one way they can do it, but I think non-appropriative forms are good too. Alex, that was a great talk. I have a question of when you were talking about the vital, in, or the how we. Right, the vital and non vital interest. Vital and non vital right. interest. And you said that you had uh, somebody that had said there were five communities that were dependent on right. subsistence, and that was about two. I mean, it was. Well, this, this was actually on a DVD people. released by the state government. I, well, that doesn't necessarily lend it any credibility, but. Um, <laughs> 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 no, I'm joking. Um, but uh, I, it's, I mean, it seems to me that there are a lot more than five communities and a lot oh, more I assume there are. people that I, are dependent I think, on a subsistence tradition, right. or I mean, for their right. economic livelihood. Right. So it, I mean, and especially, and it kind of sounded like you were belittling the subsistence, oh, I, really no, the necessity I, I, no, of it. Right. For no, people. I cer certainly don't mean to do that. I can say if I were on the other side of that debate, if I were trying to make, uh, if I were trying to make the argument uh, that predator control was necessary, for one thing, I guess I would come up with uh, data showing that that had been going on on a large scale for hundreds of years, way before Europeans ever came here, uh, and that there are massive amounts of people who are going to be starving unless we get out there and actively suppress the wolf and bear populations, and that I would give hard numbers. Right? When people make these vague generalizations, you assume there's not the data to really back that up. Right. I figured but, that's I mean, what you thought. You know, uh, does that mean that there aren't people uh, out uh, in, in some of these rural communities who it's actually economically expedient to hunt uh, elk or, or caribou, or excuse me, moose, moose, or car moose or caribou? I wish there were more elk here, but uh, uh, more, more moose or caribou, certainly, right? And I, I certainly don't want to belittle those, those cultural traditions. And, and that, you know, I, I guess I could say I, I enjoy hunting is it's a, it's a different way of interacting with the environment. I tend to be alone, you tend to pay closer attention, and so I'm not saying, well, there's this long history of my cultural traditions of doing this, but certainly I see value in it. I just don't think that it's necessary to kill wolves in order to do so. I can, I can go to the grocery store. Right, I just, I think, maybe you should not say that there are only 2,000 people that are I didn't, I, I don't, I, well, tradition. if I did, I didn't, certainly didn't mean to say that, as I say, my point is that the state government isn't really saying how many people are out there who would fit into that particular category. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, I have a, a couple comments, and I do work for the Department of Fishing Game, and I deal with predator control. What, what's your name? And my name's Kim Titus. I work for the Department of Fishing Game. I'm the deputy director, and I deal with predator control all the time. Just in the last two weeks, I received uh, two emergency petitions from rural villages, uh, one on the New Shigak River systems right. and the native communities there, and the other one on the Kuskokoom River system, where they don't have enough meat, and they're asking us to open special seasons to harvest moose right. 
and uh, ultimately the board of game turned both of those down because the harvest of moose in those areas if we allowed those seasons would be above the sustained yield and uh, so it's a real tough situation we work with our subsistence staff and trying to figure out how to accommodate them and in these cases they have winter seasons to harvest moose where that's possible to do it and it's pretty difficult to manage because uh, in many of those cases they're shooting cow moose which are exactly the moose that you don't want harvested because right. it that in the winter there are no antlers on the moose so these are antlerless seasons so that's one aspect I'd just like to comment on the other one is um, with regard to things that uh, people can do and understanding what's going on I from my perspective there's two major state laws and one federal law out there that govern sort of the, the, the things that, that deal with wildlife management in the state. And the first one is a state subsistence law. And uh, I just completed a review, of, in fact, of the harvest and the use of wild game by people in the 270 rural communities in this state that are off the road system. And we get uh, very difficult to deal with stories every day of the week of fuel that are now $11 a gallon and that the... Uh, you know, their desire to harvest wild fish and wild game in this state. So, so it's a real issue out there in Bush, Alaska, as I'm sure many of you are aware. So the first one is the state subsistence law and uh, that governs, you know, the, the way in which that operates. And the second one is the intensive management law. And both of those are things that uh, we operate and I operate under every day of the week. And the third one is really a NILCA and the rural preference that's out there. So those are, those are my thoughts on the subject. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one, one thing I would say, like, so the, so the intensive management law, I think is important, or so, sometimes reference is made to the state constitution. I think what, one thing to bear in mind with any of that is that all of these are open to interpretation. So what does it mean for, like, maximum use? One interpretation could be if we want maximum use over the long term, it's best not to engage in predator control as far as stability of species, say, a century from now, this sort, this sort of thing. Um, as far as rural population, at least, at least to my knowledge, maybe, maybe you uh, have heard something different, but the argument to kill uh, wolves uh, is a form of, like an indirect form of social welfare, I believe that goes back, uh, the earliest I could ever find was back in the 1930s. Uh, so when you had the rise of Roosevelt New Dealism, so this idea where we should uh, actually use federal dollars uh, to, to kill wolves uh, as a form of social welfare program. I think at this point, uh, we live in a post-industrial society, even in Alaska, uh, and that I think that as far as, you know, feeding people, certainly, uh, you know, I'm one of, one of those that believe that certainly the government should, should intervene to make sure that people aren't, aren't impoverished. Um, but I don't think that hunting is a reliable way to do that. I mean, that if we look at the history of hunting and gathering societies, that you have population explosions, population crashes. Uh, that it's not that reliable. That's why we switched over to agriculture. You know, pe people switched over to agriculture. I think if the issue really is about feeding the rural poor, um, that I, I don't really think that this indirect way of killing wolves so that they can feed themselves is the way to go. Uh, that certainly we've developed other things, so like uh, the Keynesian welfare state to do that. Um, I do think, yes, is there value in having people going out and directly gathering fish, gathering meat themselves? Certainly. Uh, but I think uh, messing with what Elder Leopold referred to as the biotic clock, I think the risks of that outweigh the benefits. Hi. Oh. I was wondering how carefully you studied the ads on the other side of the ballot measure. I notice, for example, an emphasis on the sort of um, emotional oh, yeah. argument, uh, right. the fuzzy animal aspect, sure. which I reported on for the Empire, all the wolf pup stuff, yeah. and people wrote zillions of letters to the editor. But I was wondering what your take on the, their approach was. Yeah, cer so certainly, uh, or maybe some of you have seen Defenders of Wildlife, they, they had their currently running in the swing states against Sarah Palin, so showing wolves killed, uh, that, that wolves, they have the status of what we call charismatic megafauna now. So they have nice, they, they have, they, you know, ni nice faces, nice eyes. They, they, they certainly have a lot of appeal. Um, and so 
uh, one, one of the things that, that I haven't had the opportunity to go into great detail is to actually study the, what, what, when I talk about propaganda, that's just information meant to sway, right? It's not meant to educate. Does the, uh, does uh, Defenders of Wildlife utilize propaganda? Absolutely, right? Uh, that both sides are using propaganda. One way to elicit, uh, of course, support is fuzzy animals being killed. So going back in the 1970s, Greenpeace running these ads about like harp seals being clubbed to death. And so they're, they're nice kind of charismatic megafauna as well. And so um, I would say in the political arena, which is probably not a surprise to anyone, that in both sides of the debate, they're trying to evoke emotion. So it being starving rural you know, natives or uh, little, little puppies being dragged out of dens and, and, and shot by uh, bad people from the state, right? I mean, so that, uh, well, that, that, uh, that, that these are meant to evoke emotion. And, it's, and certainly, I, I think if, if, if people are serious about predator control, it involves a lot of reading, right? And a lot, a lot of research. And, and not going, I mean, anybody that bases their opinion on a 30 second political ad is going to be misinformed, regardless of the source of that ad. You know, I've, I've worked with this issue, I guess, probably for 25 years. Most of the time I hated it. Uh, it's not a fun issue to deal with because the emotion is extremely high right, yeah. on both sides. And I, uh, I think that of all the meetings I've had around the state and in the villages, there are very, very few Alaskans that aren't really proud that we have wolves and really want to make sure we maintain them. There's a handful of people that I probably know because they just when I used to work there, they uh, would call me a lot. That really would like to eliminate every wolf in Alaska. But boy, you know, that's you know maybe a handful of right. people in the whole state. So and most people are proud that we have them, but a lot of people want us to manage them. You know, I I made the mistake many years ago out in one of the small villages in Interior Alaska, suggesting that you know we could bring in meat, and I almost got ran out of town. That was very, very offensive to them. They're hunters. Right. They, their culture is, evol or is evolved from hunting. And the idea that we would provide beef, uh, you know, because it was cheaper, right. <laughs> uh, was totally offensive to them. So uh, there's a lot of villages out there that are not dependent on moose and caribou because they have a lot of fish or they live on the coast and they eat whales and stuff. Right. Boy, there's villages in, in interior Alaska, north and west of Fairbanks, that <clears throat> are really dependent on moose and caribou. And they suffer when they're not there. They really do. Yeah, I, I would certainly agree with that. And I think you brought up another good point, is that we look at, well, how, how do people, what, what is their master status? How do they identify themselves? And I know, at least in Canada, that when you had, with, with some indigenous groups, when you have uh, the provider with hunting, hunters and gatherers go from being dad to the state, well, that that leads to a multitude of social problems like alcoholism. That basically, you're telling people you're irrelevant, right? And that the, the, and that's something to be taken seriously. Um, I, I think the other thing, though, that we have to deal with is that uh, there there are going to be fluctuations in game population, and that sometimes, just like you know, I, I come from the Rust Belt of the United States. Sometimes uh, the masculinity of the people I grew up was challenged when the factories would close down, right? And then temporarily step in with unemployment insurance, right? And then they get back. Nobody wants to be essentially irrelevant. Um, that to me, uh, temporary assistance until populations regenerate themselves. And, and, and but but I 100% agree with you that hunting can be an important source of people's identity, and that making people irre irrelevant, particularly in rural communities, is a bad idea. I think one start though. <laughs> is to not have people coming from out of state or urban areas uh, and killing the moose and the caribou. Uh, I heard, I listened to one um, person talk about uh, wolf kill and the thing that they um, Talked about in the wolf kill and the ch you know the chasing down the exhausting uh, and, the, and the killing of the wolf was that there was no discrimination between the alpha uh, males and females. The teachers were being killed off, and so the younger uh, wolves did not have the teachers. And 
and that could uh, lead to decimation of uh, the wolf packs and, and not that uh, you know, all of the wolves are being killed by human beings, but by human intervention into the, uh, the leaders and the, the teachers, uh, we are killing uh, more than the bullet kills. Right, a absolutely, and that's, um, so, so I talked earlier about Gordon Haber's research, saying you know, these are complex, uh, th these are uh, complex social systems, so humans aren't the only ones that have communities with defined roles. Um, and that actually one of the things that, that I was actually surprised reading Haber's research is he was saying that because undulates are used to being preyed upon, uh, that, that it's not that bad to decimate them and they can rebound without effects. But that was at least contrary to what I had learned as a hunter. So that I know like I used to hunt a lot of elk in Wyoming or Utah. That, that at least, and, th and this is just hunters saying this, this isn't like, you know, uh, environmentalists, but they say that the way elk operate is they have a lead cow that will take them down, you know, to their, their, to their feeding grounds. And, and what they'll say in hunting manuals, don't shoot that lead cow. She's the one that has that institutional memory, right, and that you can permanently disrupt those herds. And so I guess it's even more the case if you, let's say if you kill the alpha male or whatever, or the alpha couple. Uh, and so, so certainly, I, I think as we learn more about animal behavior, is that we're not the only ones that have emotions, we're not the only ones that have bonds. And I think that that's certainly something that needs to be considered in this uh, debate as well. Uh, Alex, uh, Ed McMahon over here. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah. Well, on a little lighter note nothing here. Nothing funnier than dead wolves. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, no, ho, 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 that is my line, right? Um, on a lighter note, uh, why in American, Euro-American culture has the wolf become villainized or the villain? And yeah. why are bears turned into, you know, soft, cuddly things that kids take to bed with right. them? Right. Yeah, and I think that, that that's, uh, um, if, if we look at, there, there's a, there's a, uh, one, one of my colleagues up at uh, Fairbanks, what is it, Sina, Anita or something, I can't pronounce her name correctly. But she, she's actually addressed that. Tradition, I mean, if we look at the, 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 the cultural attachments to, to bears, I mean, even going back to Roosevelt, you know, the idea of teddy bears is that Roosevelt refused to eat or, or shoot a, a chained bear. You know, so he, he said, I'm not going to participate in this can kill. This idea is cuddly teddy bears. Um, is it that, that they have a much more, I, I'm not sure exactly for the reasons. I think, you know, one of the things I've thought about, and it's not very scientific, but watching wolves move through the woods, they can be kind of scary. I mean, they're so quick and they maneuver so well. Uh, and of course, bears, just, you know, particularly black bears, they kind of lumber along. And to me, they kind of look a little stupid, to tell you the truth. They certainly don't look threatening. I mean, grizzly bear look threatening to me. But they, they, they certainly black bears kind of look, they look like big, dumb dogs to me. So I don't know. I mean, that maybe that's just part of it, is that, uh, that I don't think that black bears look that threatening. But certainly, that's deeply rooted in our culture, that bears are perceived much better uh, one thing Anita pointed out, even in gay culture, they talk about like big gay men being bears. Uh, so, uh, and of course, the wolves still have that. Uh. Um, I just wanted to answer your question. I was one of the warm fuzzy letters. Um, I think a lot of it's we did not have, I did not have the word ecocentrism to use. And that's what I was trying to, to say, actually. So I appreciate information that I got from you and hopefully this will come up again and I can write a letter that will generate a better effect. I, I teach environmental sociology. Welcome to take the class. I just might. I just might. What might be interesting to do is to look back at various stories, children's stories and myths, and you know, contrasting right. Goldilocks and Three Bears with Little Red Riding Hood. But if you looked at a whole survey of those stories, historically, how have those animals been portrayed? Right, yeah. Um, and, 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 that, and that's certainly been done, I guess, um, in medieval times. Uh, you, you know, certainly there's Little Red Riding Hood, but the myths about werewolves. Uh, but even uh, the sexual danger attached to wolves. And so I guess what, what in medieval times, people, w women who had lost their virginity, they said that they'd gone to see the wolf, right? And so, uh, and then bears, of course, uh, very, very different. Uh, and so, very, very deeply rooted in our culture. And as I said, you know, before, if we look um, that in contemporary political discourse, you can still say, well, the terrorists are like wolves, you know? Or actually, after, after World War II, 
um, that uh, with wolf eradication, they're saying, well, that the wolves are like Nazis. And so that they're really equated with uh, evil things. And that's certainly changed in, say, the last 20 to 30 years. I mean, you look at, um, you, you know, books like Dances with Wolves or Never Cry Wolf that was later made into movies is that, that certainly we perceive wolves from, through a very different lens uh, than, than people did even 50 years ago. And so I think 100 years ago, if you were to talk about eradicating wolves, uh, it, it would have been like, well, yeah, uh, they're, they're like cockroaches or rats. I mean, that nobody's going to be criticized now for exterminating, uh, you know, cockroach control programs. I mean, that would go over well. So are we about done? <laughs> or one more question? Uh, time for one more, or are we are we are we about finished? Yeah. Well, they, I, I appreciate the questions, uh, and uh, are we? So you're gonna? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. Let's give him another big round of applause. And remember, next week into the abyss: submarine exploration of the largest undersea canyon in the world. And uh, we have Friday night at Egan going till November 21st. So please come on out to UAS and enjoy many good lectures.